Okay, welcome to first presentation of the day, I guess. Glad you can make it. Um, yeah, so, my project. Um, I was suggested by my first panel to give a title to my project, so Champion's Chariot to illustrate like a, the vehicle to success that someone would be taking. Alright, um, topic-wise, I was really interested at the beginning of the year um, in like the profiles of top uh, players, specifically of Street Fighter, which is um, a game like I follow like in my own time, kind of like there's a lot of broadcasts of it, like sort of like a professional sport, I mean within the community obviously. Um, and the reason that was like, the reason that was interesting to me was because if you look at Street Fighter at a top level, there's a huge amount of choice given to players um, in how they play the game, and even at a very high level, there's a very wide variety of types of player. Um, so I was kind of curious as to how that could happen. Uh, we kind of think of there being like one right way to do things a lot of time, and in life that ends up not really being true. And I was kind of curious as to how that was possible. Like, how can everybody potentially be the best at something? Um, yeah, so from that, I got, like, my conclusion from most of my research was, like, the thing, or what I thought was going to be, was the thing that separates good players from great players um, is, like, the ability to apply oneself in a situation very well, um, like, taking into account, like, uh, with an understanding of someone's skill set and someone's talents. Um, specifically talking about Street Fighter, and there's, chess is kind of like this, and I use chess um, just because there's a lot of good research on it later, um, but in Street Fighter, uh, there's a lot of ways to approach things. I said that, but like what that means is you can, you can play the game with a lot of like scientific type knowledge on it, or, or just pick up like what works. Um, you can play with a very aggressive bent or very defensive bent, like depending on really what you enjoy. Like what you enjoy dictates how you can play the game or how you want to play the game. Um, you can't really play it perfectly is the next thing. Um, because of there being a lot of elements of like real time in it, I mean, it, it's hard to have consistent um, decision making even though it's a game based on decision making. It, ver it very much is a strategy game even though it kind of, like people look at it and they're like, oh this is just like involves punching people, but like it's, it's everything that a player does is like a, a measured gamble. But um, you can't play a perfect game so what you want to instead is to play a good game. And what, what a good game is can be different for different people. Um, and finally, and pretty importantly, the rules in a game like that, the rules in a video game, are not explicitly given to you. You kind of have to figure them out by either experimentation or um, very precise analysis of game footage using like, um, usually, done by like decompiling the game and doing a lot of like sophisticated hacking to obtain uh, quantit or qualitative information on like how move properties and stuff like that. Um, but it means that like people tend to gravitate towards their strengths when exploring the game space because that's just like like you have to have a basis for something that works in order to build upon that and then so you, you start out with an imperfect model basically and you work and try and develop the most perfect model you can completely through your own experimentation which is like a lot like life um, yeah getting back to the whole thing uh, personality comes through in a game Street Fighter or in like, if you watch how someone does something, you can see that it's it's this person. If you watch your friend do something, you can go, oh, like, like you know their little 
ticks their little uh, peculiarities. And it's like, yeah. Oh yeah, I mean, I kind of covered this, so I'm gonna go ahead. Mm, this is important. Um, I was talking about technical play versus intuitive play before, and um, taking specifically from uh, Richard Wiseman's 59 Seconds, which is a book a lot about um, the kind of things that are important to Street Fighter, very, very split second, um, often unconscious decision making. Uh, m pretty much everything people do in life, anything like, yeah, any action taken can be broken down into um, something from this going from like the, the first tier is unconscious incompetence, then uh, like conscious incompetence, uh, conscience, co yeah. conscious conf competence, and then uh, unconscious competence. And the reason like, so basically as a rule, um, the reason like unconscious uh, competence is superior to conscious competence in most situations is that um, the unconscious version kind of, it, it's the most refined version of, so someone develops a very good game plan and they want to basically forget that game plan. Um, Josh uh, Waitzkin calls it numbers to forget numbers. You're, you want to basically teach your unconscious mind how to do the thing you want to do. Um, and it, that eliminates uh, all this extra thinking that goes on um, margin for error. If you think about the, uh, is it like a juggling proverb? Like the second you think about the ball is when you drop it. That's kind of the idea behind it. It's like the less you're thinking about something, like the better you can potentially do it. But then the potential downside to that is like just mathematically speaking, there's like less of a margin for error when you know what you're doing. You can censor your action and like get back on the right path a lot more if you, so like even if you're, you're behaving at a lower, lower than maybe your conceivably peak efficiency um, with an uh, intuitive approach to something, uh, you are not risking so much because if you're, you can have very good unconscious uh, competence in an area, but you can slip then into like accidental um, incompetence and you won't realize that for the reason that like the sensor process has been taken out of the loop kind of. Um, where am I in this? Yeah. So, chess is a very like examined game, obviously by you know scientists, uh, philosophers, just pretty much any intellectual for the past couple centuries because it's been around for a really long time, and it's a really good model of um, an intellectual game. So then the question kind of becomes like, why would you look at Street Fighter over? chess. And also, you guys probably are just not that familiar with Street Fighter. So I'm going to, I have actually like an Xbox right here. So I'm going to show you guys a couple things about Street Fighter. Uh, word. Okay. So, um, Street Fighter is a game about spacing. Kind of like uh, chess is a game about position and control too. But the largest thing that is different between the two is that like Street Fighter is not, um, like in chess it's a very sequential game. You know, like I lose a piece. Like I am now at a disadvantage. When you're, when like at the end game of chess, um, play has become so different from the opening and mid game that um, it, it's almost unrecognizable and the skill set has completely changed. Like, and when you're on the ropes in chess, it's um, it's very hard to fight back. In Street Fighter, there's a lot fewer of like the uh, kind of um, situation changes and like uh, what's it called? Like the material discrepancies that develop in chess. I mean, like even from the very beginning of chess, someone is playing black and someone is playing white, and um, as a whole, like white is considered to be inferior or uh, black is considered to be inferior because you move second and like that is so you start the game with a disadvantage which really sucks um, and kind of does not 
I don't think it, it, it kind of mirrors life, I guess. But at the same time, um, it's not a, a fair playing field. Like in Street Fighter, you start always at the same spot, always at the same distance. Both players have equal access to like any character on the roster. I'm going to demonstrate that. Um, and as you can see, you can be like knocked down and things like that. And you can be reeling from getting like, it's called hit stun when a move connects. Um, um, then you have to like sit there for a little bit. But then the game resets and you're not, um, you haven't like lost a piece and now like lost capacity to play the game. Um, so then Street Fighter becomes much more about uh, patterns. Actually, I'm gonna that. Um, so as I said, like certain distances give you the ability to do certain things and to make tactical threats from those distances. Um, and that, so the, the game Street Fighter is mix-up based. It's like rock, paper, scissors where there are typically three options um, each that counters the other with uh, unbalanced rewards, so it's not exactly like rock, paper, scissors. But what I'm at, like this distance, pretty much, um, or what? Yeah. Okay, so if I'm just like sitting at this distance against a character like this, um, this is like one very, this is a, this move, basically, even if it's blocked, um, gives me an advantage because special moves, which are moves that are um, executed with like a sophisticated series of input, uh, give you a super meter, which is sort of a four dimensional measure of your success. Um, like, so you basically build that up by doing things in, that the game considers good in the match. But like, so even if this gets blocked, I still, like, it's still a successful thing for me. So this is like a fallback. Like, I, I can threaten with this regardless of what's happening. Um, and if, like, my opponent knows I'm going to do that, obviously they're going to block it. So, but if I know that they're expecting me to do this, I can just walk up and there are things in Street Fighter called throws, which you can't execute if someone is uh, held in place by um, like the after effect of a punch or like uh, if they block it or if they get hit by it, you can't like, hold on. See, like right there, my throw whiffed because um, he was in block stun, and that's like that would be extremely cheap if you could just pin someone down and throw them. But the reason throws exist is to uh, stop people from just blocking all the time, and to give like the golden rule of Street Fighter is if you know someone has, if they're going to take a certain course of action, then you're going to be able to prevent it by doing something. Um, so then he could counter like that, the the throw by inputting his own command to break the throw. Um, or by doing like a reversal move. There are moves in Street Fighter that kind of just go through everything and have like a lot of frames of what people call priority, um, which they, they usually do a lot of damage. They come out very fast and it can't be interrupted. But the downside is like if I do that, I'm now at like in a humongous, uh, like I am in recovery from that for a very long time. So it opens up a lot of opportunity. If you don't connect with that, then you have lost a ton of life, basically. It's a very bad gamble to make. Um, but if I like, yeah. So um, point being is that in Street Fighter, um, it becomes trying to predict, like, Players develop a pattern of behavior based on like what is strategically a good idea and what is pragmatically a good idea. Like if if something is is good, then it's obviously expected, and the unexpected thing would be to do like the counter to the counter. But then you get in a whole obviously it's like um, the Princess Bride with that kind of like you think I'm going to do this, so then it comes like an infinite loop. 
Um, but the difference between that and chess is like players' patterns in chess are often based off preferences, but it's much like it's with less frequency than in Street Fighter you get players doing things without realizing they're doing them. Or um, trying to fight like the neurological urge to just do things in a, in a pattern repeatedly and like react to the same thing every time. Um, uh, Where put my clicker? Um, yeah. So. Oh, yeah. My point was basically that in Street Fighter, um, a lot more of the time you're fighting natural urges. Um, and trying to interpret. Uh, information that may not all be consciously there. The most important thing in Street Fighter is being able to read your opponent and a lot of that um, has to be based on intuition and on like very large uh, meta patterns that emerge from the game. So like if yeah, like if someone shows a ha what? Can I see? Oh, oh, five minutes. Okay. Um, okay. I'm gonna go back to my. Yes. Okay. Huh. This is a good example. Okay, so so getting past that, then the question becomes. Okay, what makes someone extremely good at something? Um, in Street Fighter, uh, obviously you guys saw there's like a ton of characters to choose from. So when someone has, if someone does not have good execution, for example, if they cannot input things um, in high tension or just can't input things correctly uh, anyway, they can play a character that will um, accommodate that. Um, so like natural uh, deficiencies become a lot less important. Um, and you see people with bad execution are like, not great reactions at, at the top level of play, which are like very important skills to the game. But then, why are some players like at a plateau, and why are some above that? Um, these two players, David Serlin, who's on the left, and Daigo Umehara, have both written books on Street Fighter and are both um, pretty seasoned players. Like I think they've each been they were in the competitive scene for over over a decade. Daigo Umehara is still an active player. Um, and Daigo Umehara is a lot better player than Serlin. Um, Serlin ha has a pretty good understanding of the game and stuff. But in terms of, like, his book is called Playing to Win. And in it, he advocates using strategies that are, um, like, whatever works, basically, is what he says you should be using. Like, if something, if you can do the same move over and over again and you win, then you should be doing that. Daigo Umehara has a completely different philosophy. Um, I've read, like, they're translated uh, excerpts of his book, which is, which the title translates essentially into the willpower to continue to win. Um, and what he says is he doesn't even, he, he tries to avoid using, like, what is decided upon by the community as good moves and stuff like that. Um, when he plays a game like Street Fighter, his goal is to learn as much as possible as opposed to win as much as possible like winning he thinks has to be a side effect of like getting good at something in order to to gain the most appreciation for something um and to like reach a top level of competitive skill um you can see this like chess is, is very good and the reason I was looking at Street Fighter um, was because I was trying to draw analogies to other, other things in life. And so when you can see some of this in chess, it's pretty reassuring. Um, Kasparov is a pretty good player in his own right. Like er, Before, he was like a top player. He uh, was a grandmaster um, and the international champion for like uh, a good chunk of years. He was a guy who played Deep Blue at computer. Um, and the way he got there, 
Uh, he talks about in his book, uh, aptly named How Chess Imitates Life, um, about how basically he knew he was a good player and he was like, he had a good attacking skill set and like pretty good uh, defensive or um, positional understanding. Um, but he knew he had stuff like a weak end game and, and he would lose against players um, who he was just like playing the hardest he could and not really understand why. And he realized what he had to do to actually win was to, um, like, take the situation he was in at, at, at any time and say, like, how can, what should I be doing here? Like, Kasparov is a great player because he's a great um, analysis of his own game. And he... Like he tells this story about how he lost to a student and he basically says it was because he got cocky and he thought his play style was like at like, he thought he was like the best he could be. And he realized like he had, like there has to be a constant process of self-evaluation and redefinition um, in order to stay consistent and to stay, yeah. Um, and Josh uh, Waits King was, he's like a child chess prodigy and he loved the game, he was very into it for like at, from like age 8 to 16 and the end of his uh, time playing chess came when he had this uh, tutor uh, Mark Devoretsky who attempted to force him into playing a way that he couldn't play. Uh, Devoretsky developed um, like a comprehensive uh, chess curriculum which utilized prophylactic play in chess which is the very um, low risk positional type of play that you see a lot of uh, a lot of Soviets use like uh, Petrosian if you guys know chess at all um, but basically he hated how he was telling him to play even though it was like a very like logically that's a very good way to play because you have you don't lose at all if you're playing just to like limit all risk in a chess game but he lost motivation to play. Um, he lost his intuition when he was playing because he was playing with like a system that was completely built on things outside of himself. Like he was trying to take someone else's play style and apply it to his thing. It's like if you have a watch and you start trying to just like put random gears into it that you find from like other watches. It's, it's um, they don't sync up. And it's the same thing happened where he was just like, I didn't come across this. I can't really enjoy chess anymore. So like, why is it important to like look at how a game is played well? Um, there's a philosopher, Bernard Suits, who's uh, big on like definition of game and like why games are important. And he, his definition of game is basically um, just like our attempt to overcome something that's like unreasonably difficult um, for our own enjoyment. And in life we have to do that like all the time. Like there's tons of stuff people have to do, like obviously all the time that is hard and not fun and like takes us completely out of our element. Um, Jane McGonigal in her book, which that quote's actually from, or the Bernard Suits, I found him in there. Um, in her book, Reality is Broken, she talks about the value of games for basically that reason. Like, she thinks games can give people a very, like, positive sense of our own potential. And also, like, it, understanding that we are going to have to encounter things in life that we don't want to do, like obstacles and stuff like that. Learning to hone our skill set and learning to apply and learning to learn are extremely important things in our life. Um, and like even this is kind of a, a goofy example, but um, one of like the top, the top American player, Justin Wong, um, talks about it, in high school, he was like kind of like had no motivation. Well, this was like, so, so like try age 11 to like 14. This kid is just like going to the arcade every day and like playing games. And he started to get like very, very good. Like even with the, even at that age within his own community, he got a very like he was like, wow, like I'm really good at these games. And he's like, I'm really smart. Like I should actually apply myself to like other areas in life. Like and so 
from he games gave him the confidence or like the understanding of his own ability to perform better in school and like to like it gave him a better sense of direction in his life. Um, yeah. And like for me, like <sighs> SYP in general has kind of made me think about how important practice is to something and how important applying oneself is. Because I do a lot of, like I get very into things, but then I don't produce anything. Because it's kind of like, like I don't like even like improv games, anything like that. Like I, I want to refine everything to the point where I can just be perfect at it without ever doing it before. That's like not a realistic perspective in life. And that's not going to, like in college, I can't imagine, like that will just wear me out. Because I should have, like on this project, a lot of my production came down to, oh, is it done? Uh, a lot of, um, I put off doing things for way too long and then I had to like stay up for like a week and just like grind it all out and that's like, that's, it kind of worked but it was terrible and unenjoyable and like I don't think I developed as much as I could have from SYP and like from, and I don't from things I do, I kind of like do them, I don't, I don't learn or I don't do to learn, I kind of like do to complete. And like looking at experts at things, I think I need to learn to learn. Uh, questions? Thanks. Um, I just I wanted to ask about how the connection to chess, yeah. um, how it supports your thesis. Because you talked a lot about chess and the connection to chess and how that, that thesis you showed us in the very beginning of how um, can you just in sort of a succinct way tell us how that connection to chess actually supports the thesis or its role in the thesis? Yeah, give me a sec. Um, <laughs> Let me see. Oh, yeah. Um, if you ever look at like a champion and whoever is like dethroning them, this isn't always the case. But uh, in a great deal of them, it's like a player with a lot of natural talent uh, who is pushed out by someone who is extremely committed to studying the game of chess in general, their own game, and then um, also innovating. And like, uh, you take a look at a player like uh, Capablanca who was in like the early 20th century. One of, he was, he's still considered probably one of the strongest chess players of all time, top five definitely. Um, and he had an amazing understanding of positional chess. Like, and, and from age four, he was just watching, he watched people play the game and then started beating adults around him. Like he was a prodigy, uh, undeniably. Um, and his rival and the man who like ended up taking the world title from him. There's like a, a story where him and Capablanca were taken to a, a opera by a mutual friend. Capablanca was watching the opera the whole time and this, the other guy was like playing with like a pocket chess set, like trying to figure stuff out the entire time. Um, it's like commitment like that is what matters more than like being just like incredible and naturally at it. And like, they talk about this with Jordan and uh, Kasparov has kind of the same thing, where you can be like a great player, but like, or you can be a very, very good player, but you're not going to be like the top unless you put a ton of time into like understanding your game and like getting pla uh, past the plateau of being really good. 
there's there's a huge amount of work between being like good and like really good because you have to like you're, you're at you're you're developed into like a complete product at that point and you have to like rebuild that um, oh and like also chess just just uh, accommodates uh, variable play styles as well although it, it the most balanced play style is what ends up being important um, because you, you have to have a, a very large flexibility of play. But, okay, yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? I'm, I'm still a little bit confused in um, Chess's argument that the Um, in Street Fighter, in Street Fighter, talking about. Um, so what I like concluded was the common thread was just like, like the ability to put a per like yourself to work in a system. Um, I don't think it's necessary to acquire like every skill, but you need to take whatever strengths you have and try and compensate as much as you can for your weaknesses. Um, there's a player named Arturo Sanchez uh, who's been a, he's been playing in the competitive community for like 14 years, um, and he has terrible execution and not that great reactions. But he's a top player, and like execution reactions are extremely important. Um, to the game, and they all, like open up a ton of like not having those at your disposal limits your gameplay a lot. Uh, so how he plays is he first of all picks characters um, that allow him to like limit the game of his opponent, but in a very like methodical way. He's a great thinker, is the thing, and he uses that in his gameplay instead of like natural abilities. He he can adapt very quickly. He picks up games very quickly, and he can. He, he's a good low risk taker in pretty much every situation. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Do you personally have a ranking in any worldwide Street Fighter tournament? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> um, nothing like offline, just because I've like got my driver's license within like the past two months just now. And like, there's not, there's a community in Boston. It's not that big, though. The big communities are basically in New York City and um, California. But no, nah. I kind of I want to at some point. But playing Street Fighter as a lifestyle kind of conflicts with everything else. Did you find your own personal um, gameplay getting better after this, or have you not had much time to play? I honestly have not had that much time to play, but yeah. <laughs> I, I learn very quickly, but I don't, like, I don't play the games that much, so.